to a conclusion to it all. We're going to take a look at the role of media, the development of modern media in the shaping of the radical transformation of the revolution over the course of just the last 10 years or so. And we'll re revisit some of the ideas of Francis Schaeffer and the way that Francis Schaeffer helps us to make sense of some of postmodernism's nonsense. And he, by echoing Abraham Kuyper's great declaration uh, that there is not one square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not say, mine, Schaefer said, evangelism is primary, but it is not the end of our work, and indeed cannot be separated from the rest of the Christian life. We must acknowledge and then act upon the fact that if Christ is our Savior, he is also our Lord in all of life. Mm -hmm. This afternoon, I'm going to be speaking in Birmingham, Alabama at a pro-life conference. And I'll, uh, I'll speak on a number of different subjects over three different uh, uh, lectures uh, going into tonight, if I can find gas and can get all the way to Birmingham and all the way back. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, one of the organizers asked me to do was to address the question, is abortion a gospel issue? Is there a place for the gospel to be applied to the question of child killing? The reason he wants me to address this is that three prominent pastors in Birmingham that came out and made the argument that members of their congregation should not be involved in political issues. And abortion, in their mind, is a political issue. So does the gospel not apply to certain things? Can we pick and choose where the lordship of Jesus Christ does not apply? That's a huge question. Francis Schaeffer says, no. If Christ is Lord, he's Lord over all. There's not one square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not say, mine. Now, one of the huge obstacles in Christians coming to terms with that. It was a common notion uh, a few generations ago, but one of, the, one of the huge disjunctions in Christian thinking has come because of the omnipresence, the saturation, the smothering influence of media. And David Chagall contemporary writer has written uh, just over 70 years ago it's actually uh, now uh, a little longer ago than that a British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill described an ominous iron curtain of communism that had fallen across continental Europe uh, today while that iron curtain has lost its former power uh, alas it's regaining it but uh, another even more destructive force threatens the planet and not with intercontinental ballistic missiles, but through the ongoing sensory assaults on every human nervous system, heart, and spirit on earth. I call this worldwide blight the media jungle. Just yesterday we were told that by our own United States Senator, Marsha Blackburn, that the, the greatest threat that we face 
in the ongoing war for freedom comes from the internet and hackers who can shut down gas pipelines and bring the East Coast to a standstill. What does all of this mean and how does it relate uh, to our study of modernity? Today is May the 13th and it was on this day in 1607 uh, that a British colonists, just over a hundred of them, disembarked from uh, the Sarah Constant, uh, the Godspeed, and the Discovery uh, ships that had moored at Jamestown, Virginia, the first British settlement in North America. And we get off to a rocky start when most of those colonists refused to work. <laughs> they, they were all from uh, the lower nobility. According to the captain of the company, John Smith and Christopher Newport, only 12 of the more than 100 are laborers. 10 or 12 are mechanics, uh, while 48 are gentlemen and there are no women. That'll make for a mess. It was on this day in 1648 that the first printing of the larger and shorter catechisms of the Westminster Assembly were made available for distribution and sale throughout England and Scotland. Uh, the books were the fruit of more than five years of labor and that they remain the, among the clearest expressions of uh, Christian faith ever formulated. The question and answer format has been used to train tens of thousands, perhaps millions, of young children in the faith ever since. It was on this day in 1940 that Winston Churchill, facing the looming threat of Nazism sweeping across the European continent, in a speech to the British House of Commons, declared, I have nothing to offer but blood and toil and tears and sweat. That sentiment uh, would become the hallmark of the solitary British resistance uh, to Hitler's Nazi regime over the next five years. It was also on this day in 1956 that Ampex introduced the first commercial magnetic tape recorder for sound and picture. It's likely that most of the recording artists of the last generation recorded their first albums on Ampex tape. It was the beginning of a revolution in the development of what today we call the digital revolution. In 1981, on this day, uh, the Pope, uh, riding through Vatican Square, was shot and seriously wounded by an Islamic assassin, uh, Mehmet Ali uh, Akka. He later claimed that he had been hired by a Moscow-backed communist spy ring in Eastern Europe. And the reason that, that he was targeted for assassination, the same reason that Margaret Thatcher was targeted for assassination, was that they were threats uh, to the enduring character of that iron curtain uh, that uh, Winston Churchill uh, later at uh, Westminster College would announce. And it was on this day in 1984 that my intellectual mentor, Francis Schaeffer, fell into a coma. He had been undergoing cancer treatments at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, New York. And uh, his cancer advanced to the point that doctors despaired of his life. Indeed, two days later, on May the 15th, he died. 
It was uh, the end of a remarkable uh, run of influence. Uh, Newsweek magazine called him the guru of the evangelicals. Time magazine called him uh, the single greatest intellectual influence since C.S. Lewis. He was uh, influential both in the shaping of what was uh, called the Christian right or the silent majority or the moral majority as well as raising up a, a new prominence for reformational thinking. Uh, we've talked about Schaefer a great deal during our study of modernity uh, based upon his understanding of how cultures change, how revolutions and reformations can make a real difference in the details of art, music, literature, ideas, uh, and uh, the structure of a culture. But, but Schaefer's greatest contribution was perhaps his understanding of a great divide in modern philosophy that helps us understand the differences not just between Plato and Aristotle, Plato's universals and Aristotle's particulars, but helps us understand how it is that a person could say, I was born in the wrong body. My DNA says that I am a man. That's objective. That's the fact. But that's not the reality. In reality, I am a woman. And that may appear to be subjective. That may be just feelings. Psychologists used to call it gender dysphoria. But this is a reality. Schaefer argued that when we create this divide in reality between the spiritual realm, which is superior to the material realm, what we do is we create a conflict in culture that cannot be resolved rationally. It's a revolutionary impulse that upends everything. This is why an ideology like Marxism can masquerade as a form of economics even though the math doesn't work, never has worked, never will work. Marxism has this allure. Socialism has this appeal because of an upper story set of assumptions that do not match the lower story details. Doesn't match in history, doesn't match in mathematics, doesn't match in economics, uh, but the appeal is there anyway. But that this was the great divide that we saw between the romantics and the pragmatists of the Enlightenment. It's at the heart of how ideology has run roughshod over the whole 20th and now into the 21st century. So what we've seen, uh, just sort of by summary, is that, that uh, ideology yearns for a kind of instantaneous, revolutionary overturning of all the foundations of the past. One of the things that media does is it makes that convulsive, instantaneous overturning immediately accessible. It uh, overturns the old order by presenting the new, the snazzy, the, the, the wow. And it fabricates the idea of a new order in a sense it functions very much like science fiction. It imagines some kind of a future and then presents that as an upper story reality to overturn the objective facts 
of the old order. It creates the possibility of a radical reversal, not just in morality, where uh, 10 years ago, if you had suggested that someone that uh, was uh, a, a bigot and needed to be canceled simply because they believed that marriage was appropriate between a man and a woman. But now 10 years later, it's just common sense uh, that in the corporate world, in the media world, that, that in uh, the world of entertainment, that in the world of academia, if you hold to those old and antiquated values, you know, the ones from 10 years ago, that there is no place for you in life or society. It's this radical overturning of standards of morality. But not just that, in the name of science, there is a denial of science. We, we overturn biology itself. Doesn't matter what DNA says. It doesn't matter what 3,000 years of human history say. Somehow we know better. And we present that through the process of suppression of facts, repression of opposing views, and censorship. We'll just kick you right off of Facebook if you have a different view about anything that is a part of the new morality. Remember, we uh, we made the argument some time ago that all societies have blasphemy laws. And you can tell what the gods of a society are by what you're not allowed to say. Well, the enforcers of that in our day are modern media. Modern media meaning the whole structure of it. So there are several ways that Christians can respond to this reality, this, uh, this new hegemony. One, one is what we might call scarpercies. Uh, it uh, comes from the word scarper, which means to flee. It, uh, it's, it's basically a negation and a denial. Uh, we, uh, we'll, we'll just uh, close our eyes. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll put uh, some sort of software to protect us on our computers from anything intruding from the outside world. We'll, we'll limit our access. We'll, we'll uh, play like uh, Pollyanna and ignore uh, the reality of the world. Uh, we, we deny it. We negate it. We abscond ourselves from it. Uh, another response is the synthesis. We just say, okay, well, this is the way it is. And so we accept it. We justify it. We, we absorb it. Uh, we become just like the culture. Uh, one of the things that I'm often asked by people is, how did my pastor go from being a clear proclaimer of the gospel. Now, how did our school transform itself from a place where it was clear biblical morality came first to suddenly being a place where the cancel culture, the progressive values, critical race theory, all of these things suddenly become normative. And not just normative, but they take center stage. They become the new morality. How did this happen? The, the answer is synthesis. We're part of this culture. We've got to accommodate ourselves to the culture. We don't want to be irrelevant to this culture. Uh, so we've got to absorb this culture. And what happens is the, the, those churches wind up looking like the culture. instead of a scandal to the culture, which is the word that the Apostle Paul uses for the gospel. It's a scandal. 
Uh, another possibility besides escape and acceptance is antithesis. But this is called for real reformation. It, it's called for resistance. It's what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, when he says, do not be conformed to this world. Resistance. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that, and then here comes uh, the radical uh, reformation part, so that you may be able to prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So what, what that means is, is that as Christians, we've got to choose. If we're not going to accept the madness of the world, we've got two choices. Scarphosis or antithesis. Scarphosis might be called the Benedict option. Uh, that's where we retreat, we create monastic communities, we hide ourselves away, and we have our nice little Christian schools, we have our nice little Christian churches, and we, have, and we patronize our nice little Christian shops, and we don't really engage in the world because, after all, the world is poisonous. That's the Benedict option. Or there is the Boniface option. The Boniface option says, hey, yes, uh, let's have our Christian schools because we need to train up warriors. And yes, uh, let's have our Christian churches uh, which can proclaim the gospel with clarity and scandal. And yes, uh, let's build up enterprises among Christians so that we can build a viable economy. But let's sally forth into the midst of this poor fallen world with an axe on our shoulder to chop down the sacred groves. problem is, is that the Boniface option really does take time. It's incremental. It takes development. It's a long obedience in the same direction. It means reforming the old order. Now, I just want to give you a glimpse of how radically things have changed. Now, I know and you know that I'm old. I can remember when a loaf of bread cost 19 cents. I remember when a first class stamp went up from five cents to six cents and my parents were outraged. I know I'm old, but I want to give you a glimpse of the difference that has existed in the way we consume media just in my lifetime. When I was born, we didn't have a television. We actually had a radio. But then, of course, uh, we quickly advanced. And we would gather around the television for uh, what was family entertainment. Of course, th this quickly devolved uh, to the point that uh, instead of a communal activity, we found ourselves in restaurants where every single soul in the restaurant was glued to their individual iPhones. And then, of course, there's this. So how do we get there? How did media transform us? Well, the, the history of uh, modern media really begins with the radio, and it begins with Thomas Alva Edison. In 1885, he developed uh, radio telegraphy. Uh, this is uh, the sending of telegraph messages, dots and dashes, by a wireless radio communications. <clears throat> it was a huge development. Now, Edison, of course, was a great inventor. He gave us the first audio recording device, the, the, the beginnings of recorded music. 
he gave us uh, the first real possibility uh, for uh, the uh, viewing of motion pictures. He gave us the light bulb. He gave us uh, the basis for an electronic engine. Now, all kinds of great inventions, but it was his experiments with pulse wave theory that paved the way for the technology of the radio. When uh, Nikola Tesla, a Hungarian uh, inventor who came uh, eventually to the United States, uh, he uh, today is oftentimes described as a Serb. He is a, of Serbian descent. His home is in what is today Croatia, uh, but he was a part of the Hungarian Empire when he was born. So is he Hungarian or Serbian or Croatian? They, they, they can argue about it. What we know is that uh, Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla, uh, through their inventions, made the possibility of sending uh, not just uh, dots and dashes, uh, but but sound impulses through a magnetic receiver. Uh, this was developed in 1891. Uh, when uh, uh, Jagdish Bose, an Indian inventor in 1894, uh, began experimenting with uh, compressed waves called microwaves, it was possible to send larger packets of information uh, wirelessly, and this is the beginning possibility for real broadcast radio. Marconi, uh, uh, Guglielmo uh, Marconi, an Italian uh, inventor, uh, was able to uh, air the first real broadcast from London, England, uh, beneath what is now the BT Tower in 1906. By 1902, uh, magnetic impulses were being sent across the Atlantic, and with the invention of the vacuum tube, Marconi saw the opportunity to create a commercial enterprise around the idea of radio, and he begins uh, to attract investors, huge investors, uh, from Great Britain and across Italy, and uh, a, a tremendous amount of wealth was built up in the first real media empire, uh, then called the Marconi Company. Uh, uh, later, uh, the Wireless Telegraph and Signal Company, a company created by Thomas Edison uh, with investors like uh, uh, the, the Mellons and the Carnegies and the Vanderbilts uh, were able to create a new American conglomerate that would rival and eventually buy out Marconi, a company called General Electric. General Electric spun off their machine operation, uh, originally called Edison Machines, uh, and uh, Edison, who was that in his day, sort of a combination of an Elon Musk uh, with uh, a little bit of Jeff Bezos and a little bit of Steve Jobs all mixed in together. He was an inventor. He was an Imagineer. He was uh, kind of the Walt Disney uh, uh, slash uh, Steve Case of his day. Uh, he created a spin-off called Westinghouse, and Westinghouse went into the business of broadcasting radio waves. The first radio station was KDKA in 1920, broadcasting from Pittsburgh. Now, the reason from Pittsburgh uh, was that Edison discovered uh, that uh, while towers were helpful for the dissemination of uh, broadcasts. Uh, this was an idea that uh, Marconi had come up with to put the broadcast uh, way up on a transmitter high in the air. It was even better, Edison discovered, if it could travel across 
smooth water. And Pittsburgh, at the, at the conjunction of three rivers, was the perfect place to send that signal off in three different directions, from the uh, air and along the water and then out to sea. Uh, eventually, Westinghouse uh, spun off its uh, broadcast unit so that Westinghouse could focus on making the machines uh, and its broadcasting uh, company would be called the National Broadcasting Company. All of this that spun out of the mind of Thomas Edison. And NBC was created in 1926, a rival for rival investors. Uh, Columbia Broadcasting Company uh, was created the next year, CBS, in 1927. And suddenly, the possibility for uh, national radio was, uh, was made possible. But movies, uh, again, we have to go back to Thomas Edison. He creates uh, the first real motion picture machine, a uh, kinetoscope, in 1891. Essentially, what a kinetoscope was, what was a single viewer machine where you looked through a peephole at moving pictures. It was based on uh, things like the zoetrope and the phonetoscope uh, and the development of celluloid photographic film uh, going back from 1833 all the way to 1887. But very quickly, that it was realized that uh, you didn't necessarily need a kinetoscope in order to view a uh, film that moved along a little track. If you set light behind it and a lens in front of it, it was possible to project those images on a flat screen. And that gave birth to Hollywood. In 1914, Charlie Chaplin had made the classic film the Tramp, and it was a viral sensation, if you can use the word viral for 1914. Uh, in 1915, D.W. Griffith had made a film about the post-war South called Birth of a Nation, and it was the first film uh, that used uh, crowd scenes, panoramas, it used uh, distant uh, uh, horizon shots that, uh, that would then uh, come in and focus on a single person uh, and had motion shots. It, it was a, an incredible leap forward. And then in 1927, Fritz Lang uh, made the still amazing film Metropolis, uh, which uh, became incredibly influential in the creation of everything from uh, the superhero comics uh, to science fiction dramas uh, to, uh, to gritty crime dramas in the future. Edison, always the entrepreneur, saw the opportunity uh, for film and in 1893 he created the first movie studio. At first it was connected to his Westinghouse a manufacturing plant in Synecdoche, New York, uh, but he quickly moved it to the Bronx and uh, then uh, over to Brooklyn. Uh, meanwhile, that out in California, a, a fledgling group of actors and directors had decided to rival Edison in the creation of Keystone Pictures Studio. Uh, this was the beginning of Hollywood. And uh, by 1919, a group of powerful actors, unsatisfied by the studio system that locked them into contracts, uh, that forced them to, uh, to work with uh, minimal budgets, uh, D.W. Griffith, the great director, along with Mary Pickford, Charlie Chaplin, and Douglas Fair Fairbanks, created a whole new studio for artists called United Artists. And then there's TV. 
uh, television developed out of some of the same technologies as radio, but uh, John Logie Baer, the Scottish inventor in 1925, found a way to, uh, to compress and to condition microwave signals so that he could magnetically project images on a screen. Uh, that, that this uh, was greatly enhanced by another Hungarian, Coleman uh, Tiani, in 1927 with the development of electro scanning. It was uh, the ability uh, to take a gray screen and magnetize it so that images could appear. They were rudimentary. Uh, oftentimes they would hop and skip and jump, uh, but it was the beginning of a real leap forward in television. And then uh, display interlacing, uh, the invention of uh, an American, Philo Farnsworth in 1928. And then uh, the real leap forward, uh, the ability to carry those images across cables uh, was uh, made possible by the creation uh, by Bell Telephone of the coaxial cable. Originally developed to carry sound, but it was quickly uh, discovered that uh, uh, images could be carried as well. So Edison's General Electric in Schenectady in 1928 uh, began the process of, of uh, building both uh, the units that could project and the cameras that could capture the images that would be the first televisions. Uh, the Radio Corporation of America, uh, another one of Edison's companies, uh, became independent and then spun off uh, WNBC in New York in 1929. And then the real breakthrough for television came in 1936 with the Berlin Olympics. <clears throat> it was there that uh, the world became enamored with the idea that instantaneous images from around the world could be broadcast into homes and into businesses simply by turning on a switch. Uh, by 1941, the idea uh, was uh, floated to create uh, interlinked networks of various broadcast stations. And so WNBC TV created the NBC network. Uh, this uh, was uh, quickly followed by the first commercial advertising advertising for Bulova watches, also in 1941. And shortly thereafter, CBS TV in 1948, ABC TV uh, came along two years later, and color television was introduced in 1961. I can still remember, in 1961, the entire neighborhood going over and crowding into one person's house who had just bought a color television. There were only two shows on television that were broadcast in color. So it really wasn't worth buying unless you were, like this neighbor, ridiculously rich. So we all crowded in and waited for the moment when Walt Disney's Wonderful world of color came on, and Tinkerbell flew across the screen, waved her wand over the top of Cinderella's castle, and suddenly colors burst onto the screen. It was really terrible, <laughs> but fascinating. It didn't look real, it looked like uh, you know that really old lady that uh, dyes her hair bright orange or blue? It was kind of like that. <laughs> but, but it was stunning. 1961. And, and then there's video games. Uh, video games really developed out of 
uh, the screen technologies of uh, television and the, the possibility of sending various kinds of signals. At first, uh, video games were a serious experiment. Uh, as uh, you can see, uh, uh, most of the early video games came from places like MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, where students uh, put together a, uh, a programming project and uh, sort of their version of the 40-hour project. And it was this uh, rudimentary system of little dots. Uh, there would be uh, these kind of uh, triangular dots that would come down from the top of the screen. Uh, these were alien spaceships. And then there were little dots down on the bottom. These were the laser cannons. And the task was to shoot your laser cannon to try and knock out uh, the little triangles before they came down and subsumed planet Earth and destroyed civilization as we know it. Great 40-hour project. It was uh, preceded in 1952 by a really boring game that has nothing but zeros and X's on it. That's why it's called OXO. Uh, and before that, uh, the NIM, the Nimrod computer, which is uh, basically a computerized version of that little golf tee game that you play on the table at Cracker Barrel. Not particularly sophisticated. But in 1971, Nolan Bushnell uh, created an arcade version of Space War called Computer Space. And it was the beginning of the real development of video games. It was uh, followed in 1972 uh, by uh, Bushnell and Ted Dabney's uh, new game called Pong. It was uh, based on a little box uh, with a cartridge that looked like an 8-track cartridge that you plugged into your television. And Pong had two little paddles and a little ball. And you moved the paddles up and down, and you basically played tennis. And uh, it was slow, but it was, in those days, so fascinating. It would go... And if you were really good, it would go. T -t 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 -t. <laughs> and if you were expert, it would go. T -t 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 -t. And that was it. That was the whole game. <laughs> uh, but it's the beginning of of real video games. Uh, Space Invaders comes along in 1978, and then the real breakthrough comes when Nintendo creates the game console. Now, uh, Nintendo was a Japanese company that had been created in the 19th century uh, to make card games. But with the advent of the video technologies, they came up with a game console uh, that, uh, that revolutionized the use of video games starting in 1977. Mario Brothers introduced in 1983 the Nintendo Game Boy. You play video games in your hand, 1989, and then Sony, uh, the first version of the Sony PlayStation in 1994. The internet, uh, packet switching, that's, uh, that's the idea of taking uh, bundles of data, packets, and uh, switching those bundles of data from one place to another digitally. Uh, that technology was invented uh, by Donald Davies in 1961. And then the ARPANET, the first network, uh, was utilized to connect the campuses of the University of California, uh, utilizing Honeywell Corporation technology in 1969. This is the beginning, the first true computer network, the beginning of the idea of the internet. And then in 1970, Arthur C. Clarke 
the uh, science fiction author of, uh, of books like 2001 Space Odyssey conceived of the idea of utilizing digital microprocess data packets bouncing off of satellites as a means by which a world could be connected wirelessly. That utilizing the same kinds of ideas, only radically advanced and digitized as radio and television, but now uh, using it for the transfer of data information. By 1988, uh, the internet protocol system had been put into place with uh, uh, TCP and IP addresses in the beginnings of the HTTP uh, system uh, established by the National Science Foundation. In 1976, Steve Jobs came up with the idea of a software system that could actually be utilized by, by multiple uh, uh, machines and of multiple types. Uh, he called it OSI. Uh, by 1981, uh, the, uh, the idea of a kind of universal operating system was, uh, was developed at Harvard University. And the Harvard student, who, who would soon drop out, uh, would buy that uh, system, uh, rename it Microsoft or MOSDOS, and develop a universal operating system for personal computers. In uh, 1988, Steve Case uh, created uh, a means for Apple computers to, compu uh, uh, to communicate with each other. It was called Apple Link at first. Uh, he later renamed it America Online, utilizing telephone lines uh, computers would be able to connect and emails could be sent. Uh, by 1984, uh, Steve Jobs revolutionized uh, computing with uh, the introduction of the Macintosh computer. He revolutionized it once again three years later with the introduction of a handheld computer called the Apple Newton. Uh, but he was booted out by the board of directors of Apple. He formed his own company called Next Computer in 1990 and developed a means by which Next Computers, by taking a huge leap forward, could actually connect to those fledgling new internets uh, through AOL and a host of other uh, means. Uh, and then that was given a huge leap forward in 1994 with the creation of the Netscape web browser, which came along uh, long before Explorer or Safari. And then in 1998, almost bankrupt, Apple computer went back to Steve Jobs, begged him to come back. He introduced a new line of personal computers called the iMac in 1998. Again, a little stroll down memory lane. When I was a kid, <coughs> when I was in college, this is what a computer looked like. You programmed it with cards. You had these, uh, these cards that uh, were eight inches long and three inches wide and you punched little holes in those cards. Uh, that was the code. That, and it would take a whole box of those cards to do a single program. But later, now I saw computers develop uh, to the place where you didn't need the cards anymore. Instead, you had magnetic tape uh, that uh, produced the programs. And then there was my first computer, the very first Mac. 
hello, new world has come upon us. The so market innovation was a huge part of the development of modern media. Uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World was published in 1932. Uh, George Orwell's 1984 was published in 1946. Uh, they imagined a time uh, when media would come to dominate culture. Uh, the Air Force uh, developed uh, packet switching uh, for their communications in 1961 when Arthur Clarke uh, in 1970 described uh, uh, satellite transmissions. Uh, BBN created email as CompuServe in 1972 and then in 1983 William Gibson imagined a world that you could visit for any form of information and for any form of experience in his novel Neuromancer. I picked it up when it came out in paperback the next year in 1984 and I was stunned by the revelation of what the future might look like. Apple launched the Mac in 1984. Cell, cell phones came out in 83, the year before. Uh, Microsoft overhauled Mazdas as Windows in 85, and Apple Link uh, came out in 87. Uh, these uh, were facilitated by these huge, huge technological leap forward. Uh, from Apple Link to AOL in 88, the Mac Portable in 89, the Netscape Browser in 94, uh, the iMac in 98, uh, the Google search engine in 1998. And then, to revolutionize music and eventually movies, Napster, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing in 1999, iTunes came out in 2000, and then the iPod. As Steve Jobs said, you could carry a thousand songs in your pocket. So with uh, iTunes and the iPod, the, suddenly there was the possibility to create social media networks. And uh, MySpace Social came along in 2003, the thinking that uh, MySpace was too cumbersome and not aimed at uh, what his primary aim was, uh, and that is finding the cutest girls on the Harvard campus, Mark Zuckerberg created Face uh, Mash in 2004. Face Mash, of course, would catch on uh, multiple other uh, good old boy networks in uh, the Ivy League would pick up on it uh, as they uh, sought to pick up uh, the cutest girls on campus. Uh, but Zuckerberg realized uh, that there was a greater application for Face Nash and he created Facebook. Twitter came along in 2006, the iPhone in 2007, uh, the App Store in 2008, and the Kindle uh, that later that same year. Uh, then came Google Android, a knockoff of uh, the iPhone in 2008. The iPad came in 2010 along with uh, iOS Instagram, initially only available for iOS devices. Snapchat in 2011. Music MySpace, Justin Timberlake's new uh, attempt to revive uh, the old moribund MySpace in 2012, and Gab, an alternative social network in 2017. So much changed. According to Neil Postman, in all of this, what we have found is that we are amusing ourselves to death. He compared the Orwell and Huxley's visions of the future, Brave New World in 1984. Orwell imagined that with the advance of all of this technology, we would find ourselves in an oppressive cultural prison. It would lead to the banning of books, cancel culture. 
We've been deprived of information. Big media monoliths. We have totalitarian oppression. And we'd be controlled by inflicting pain. Huxley's vision was, but was slightly different. He believed that instead of an oppressive cultural prison, we'd have the cultural equivalent of the, the bumble puppy. The, the, uh, a smothering cultural burlesque uh, where we have a flood of options, of entertainments, but a thousand channels and nothing to watch. There'd be no reason to ban books because no one wants to read books. We're drowning in irrelevant information. This uh, bumble puppy becomes a kind of centrifugal ma uh, machine that throws everything uh, against the wall and makes us all dizzy. Instead of controlling us by inflicting pain, but this vision controls us by inflicting pleasure. According to Neil Postman, the actual future is a bizarre combination of both. It's not Orwellian, but it's sort of is. And it's not Orwellian, but it sort of is. And becomes more and more of a hybrid with every passing day. And so the revolution is realized in a kind of new hegemony where media becomes this smothering blanket, a shroud like the shroud of Strabo. Francis Schaeffer made the argument that all of this is made possible when we separate the objective from the subjective and we make the subjective superior to the objective. In other words, uh, values are more important than facts in the shaping of culture. So what I feel, what I think, what my truth is, supersedes the, any other thing in the material realm. Now here's what's really scary about this. This is easy to picture in the transgender debate. This is easy to picture in the marriage debate. This is easy to picture in the debates over ideology. What's harder for us to swallow is that the modern evangelical church has actually fully participated in and facilitated this great divide. See, the truth is, is that the only divide that exists in the created world is the divide between the creature and the creator. That there's not a separation in man between soul, spirit, and body. We're one thing. But there's not a separation between the spiritual realm, which is somehow superior to the material realm. There's not a separation. They're all one thing. The only divide is between the created world and the creator. So when we create this divide, but when we say spiritual things are more important than bodily things, we make an excuse for the bodily things to be either neglected or abused. So we say things like, well, yes, I know that they're living together, but they really love Jesus. So their supposed orthodoxy now is more important 
than their heteropraxy. Their beliefs, their feelings, are, their desires are more important than how they act. See, one of the things that the gospel says is that, uh, that what we believe and what we do should be completely connected. How we spend our money should be just as much a reflection of our discipleship as how we talk to our friends. Our checkbook should be a statement of faith just as surely as the things that we say on Sunday mornings. But in the Christian world, we tend to separate those things. That we, we think of the spiritual realm as being more important than the physical realm. This is why the, a, a calling uh, to be a plumber is considered less noble than the calling to be a preacher. It's not true. All callings are sacred. Every single one of them. So one of the things that this does is it causes us to realize that, that we can make a real difference by applying our gifts and our callings in the real world under the lordship of Jesus Christ for his glory in the midst of a broken, fallen world, and that's the pathway of reformation. How do we deal with the monolith of media? Well, that we don't run from it and ignore it, nor do we simply embrace it. Our call is to engage and change it. Our call is to go forth and change the world. Because the created order is, as Genesis 1 says, good. And human beings should be pro-existence. We shouldn't cut ourselves off. That was the great contribution of Francis Schaeffer in modern thought. He enabled us to see how it is that we ought to think and how then should we live. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. The kingdoms of this world are the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion and it shall not pass away. That's the story of modernity and our response to it. And we are done.